So welcome everybody. Uh, and let's, as always, let's start by kind of slowing down now, getting settled into a comfortable place. Uh, and let's take some conscious breaths. Slowing down our nervous system. For anyone who might be caffeinated, let's take that caffeine energy and bring it up to our ability to focus. Really listening, really learning, taking it in. Putting away the distractions. Letting go of whatever we might have been doing or thinking about before the class. And dropping into a place where we learn. We're going to learn some very important tools today. Today we're learning all about how to make requests, how to most likely get our needs met. And we're also going to work on how to say no and how to hear no, which is a very, very important tool for us to learn in our relationships and very important for us to be able to coach people with, coach people how to do that. So today's an important class. <sighs> And as a way for all of us to get connected, I'd love for each of us to put into the chat box one wish for what we want to experience in this new year. Not only a new year, actually, it's a new decade, but what's one thing you really want to experience in the year 2020? So you can open your eyes once you get clear on what that's going to be. And for anybody who doesn't know, there's a chat box. If you're on a computer or an iPad or a device like that, you just scroll down at the bottom. There's a, like a little toolbar. Just click where it says chat. Um, and make sure that you're chatting to everyone. And I'll send you a first chat, please. Aha. Uh -huh. And as you put yours in, after you've put yours in, then go back and take a look at everybody else's. What a wonderful way for us to get to know each other. Beautiful. What a wonderful way to kind of connect with each other a little bit. And as you read each person's, just know it to be so for that person. So for example, for Laura, we know that she will experience deeper self-acceptance in the practice of transurfing her physical reality. I've never heard that word before. That's a great word, transurfing. I like that. Mm. Still waiting to hear from Allie. And who else have we heard from? Daniel. Daniel, if you can hear us. Beautiful. All right. 
So thank you, everybody. And you just practiced what we're going to be learning today. I made a request, and you all fulfilled my request. Now, it was a fairly easy request, and I'm the authority figure, so it helps um, uh, that you're most likely going to do it. Um, but it, life's not always that easy. And so today's are very, what we're working on is actually very practical stuff. Um, again, how to make requests. So I'm going to be doing some screen shares. And well, let me actually, before I do that, let's do this one. <clears throat> So this is a, a cool little, a little one. Can everybody uh, see the four, the box, you know, the square with the four boxes? Um, give me a thumbs up if you can see this. Okay, great. So what we always want to do is have our request be an invitation, and we want to be specific. Now, that's what I did. I was very, you know, I, I invited you, you know, I did it in kind of a loving way. And I was specific. One wish that you have for 2020. Okay, it was very specific. But when kind of the opposite of an invitation is when we make a demand, right? When we demand, you must do this, right? And also, the opposite of specific is vague. So just briefly, what happens is if we invite somebody, but we're vague about it, then we're kind of wishing. That's when it's kind of like, gosh, uh, it'd be kind of nice, Mimi, if, if you, you know, maybe sometimes just tell me how, you know, you like the class, right? I'm kind of like vague, I'm inviting it, but I'm, I'm, it's like a wish, right? You know, wouldn't it be nice if someday Mimi like told me how wonderful I am, right? Um, so, and oftentimes we start our, our words with, wouldn't it be nice, or gosh, sometime it would be great if, right? And we're being vague in that place. We're, we're in a wishing energy. Now, when we're vague and demanding, that's kind of the lower left-hand corner box, that's when we're laying a guilt trip. You know, Mimi, if you really loved me, you would tell me how wonderful this class is, right? It's like a guilt trip, right? I'm being vague because I'm not, you know, really, well, I'm definitely not inviting her. I'm demanding, right? Um, actually, I guess I was being a little bit more specific to so be like, I don't know, see, the guilt trip would be more like, Mimi, do you even enjoy this class, right? Now that's like a guilt trip. And I'm, what am I wanting, right? <laughs> right? I guess she could try and figure out, well, he wants me to know that I enjoy the class. Hope you don't mind my picking on you today, Mimi. Your, your box is what showed up immediately for me, so. Um, now, we can be specific, but still demanding, and that's like when it's an extortion. If you wanna stay in this class, you're gonna tell me how wonderful I am every week, right? It's extorting, and if she doesn't do what I say, out, out. So, obviously I'm using exaggerations here. But it's really important for us to be aware, when are we being vague? And when are we being specific? When are we really inviting? And when are we demanding? And so again, ideally, with this example, it would be, Mimi, I really enjoy your presence in the class. And your feedback's really valuable to me. So um, I would love for you to perhaps, at the end of the class, um, just privately, if you would be willing to send me a text message, letting me know what really worked for you, what didn't work. Um, and I really respect your opinion. So I want you to be honest and that would be really wonderful. Would you be willing to do that? I'm very specific and inviting and see the response I get. So, um, so just on this initial little piece, who, as you looked at that, noticed, and I'm not going to call on you, but by raising your hands, who noticed that, wow, sometimes I'm kind of vague, 
in what I'm wanting. Who noticed that comes up for you? Yeah, okay. And who noticed that sometimes you have trouble being specific? Right? That's kind of the opposite, yeah. And who noticed that, wow, sometimes you can be demanding, especially with people we're close to, right? We can be demanding with the people we live with or, right? Yeah, so there it is. Okay, we're gonna go to the next piece here, whoops. We are going to go to just kind of the basics of how to make requests. Here we go. So, everybody able to see that okay? Mimi, give me a thumbs up. Can you guys see that okay? Okay. Um, I'm gonna kind of read this just because it's basic, but it's really important. A request, the purpose of a request is to bring us into the now and to contain a doable action. Would you please right now in the chat box, give me a wish for 2020. And it's really important to make it a positive action. I would really love if you would share with me what you want to experience in 2020. Um, and then of course, we offer a choice to fulfill it or not. I kind of didn't do that, to be honest, at the beginning, but um, so see, I'm still learning what I'm teaching 20 years later. Um, uh, kind of the classic nonviolent communication way of asking is, would you be willing to put into the chat box a, a vision, a dream that you have for 2020? And that's a Marshall Rosenberg thing, and it's great, because would you be willing? We want people to be willing to fulfill our request. We want them to be willing. It's all kind of basic, so I'm going to continue on, but then I'll open up for questions and such in a moment. So there are three kinds of requests, connecting requests. This is really important, especially for those of you as coaches. When you're working with people um, and you say working with a couple or you're working with two friends and they're in a, a difference, they're in a hard space with each other, lots of connecting requests before we get to the action request. Or even in our personal lives, <clears throat> if we're having a difference with our wife, our husband, our friend, our roommate, we need to make connection requests before the action requests. And human nature is we go straight to the action request. So um, I'm gonna use uh, an example, let's say, my roommate uh, and I, I have an issue about the roommate not cleaning the dishes. Um, so if I go straight into, my God, the kitchen is a pigsty, it's a mess. Are you gonna clean these damn ki dishes? Well, that's not gonna get us off to a good start. And I'm going right into the action request and I'm being demanding, right? But what we need when we're upset, when we're triggered, or it's a possible difference, we need connection requests first. Wow, um, would you be willing for us to talk about the state of the kitchen right now? Or if I've said, wow, I'm, I'm feeling a little bummed as I look at the kitchen, um, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to acknowledge that right now I'm feeling uncomfortable with the way it looks. So connection requests, of course, the most important one is when we're having a big conversation or if we're facilitating a big conversation, after someone says something important, will you be willing to reflect back what you just heard me say? Or as a coach, Mimi, can you reflect back what you just heard Mandy say? Right. So, and as coaches, we always have to keep doing that, making sure because so often when when all of us as human beings are in a difficult situation and, and it's a, a, an argument or a, even a fight, we're not really listening to what the other person's saying. We're in reaction. Oftentimes we've already, we're triggered. We're already thinking what our rebuttal is gonna be or what they did that was wrong. We're not really listening. 
And remember the whole point, the prime directive, is to understand each other. And the best way of feeling understood, one thought at a time, and then asking for reflection. So connection requests are how we stay connected, which is really, really, really important. And, um, and it could be any of the examples you see there. You know, would you be willing to tell me how you feel about what I just said? And then if we have made a, an action request, can you tell me what needs of yours would be met by saying yes, or what needs of yours are not being met? And why is a no, right? So connection requests are really important. I'm, I'm gonna come back for a moment and just see, are there any thoughts or questions about that so far? Is it all good? Okay, is this useful? People enjoying this? Okay, cool. Thank you. See, I was making a connection request. Yes, Mimi. Um, are you posting this or can you post this later or in the box? Yeah, and you know what? Feel free to nudge me, um, you know, send me a, a text reminding me to do that. And I'll okay. post all of these um, and I'll also send them out. I know you like it on email. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah, thanks for the reminder. Okay, let's go back. All right, so the next example of requests are action requests. We love those. I want you to do this now. But always ideally just get into the habit of would you be willing? What would you need to feel good about doing this? You know, um, would you be willing to let me know your opinion about this action request? and being specific and doable. So back to the dishes example, would you be willing to do the dishes and clean the kitchen before you go to sleep tonight? That's specific and it's doable. Would you be willing to always do the dishes when you're done? It's not necessarily doable. It's specific, but it's what Marshall Rosenberg would call um, an unrealistic request or an undoable request, because we're now asking someone for the rest of their life to do something, right? It's not, it's not realistic. Marshall used to get into trouble because he talked about how um, making a commitment to be faithful in your marriage for the next 30 years was an example of an undoable request. And he got a lot of flack for that. I mean, he happened to be polyamorous. Um, you know, but of course, people who are monogamous didn't want to hear that. And it led to many dynamic conversations back in the day. Um, so actions requests are when we're asking people to do something. Yes, Mimi. I do have a question. Uh, as a parent, how would I say that without the, okay, so I have a lot of teenagers in the house. The kitchen is a great example of an everyday event. Um, how do I say it without the guilt trip, without the shaming, and with the with the full like recognition of no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> no, I don't want to clean up the big mess that I just made in your in the house, you know. So what do you do with it when that when it's genuinely a because they say that to me often. Of um, well, this really isn't a question though, is it, Mom? This isn't really like do I want to do it? This is a it needs to be done, and you did right. it. So what, how do you negotiate that? It's a good question. Whenever we're asking someone to do something, especially if it's something that they have resistance to, we need to have a conversation about it. And we need to ideally, when they're well-resourced, create an environment. So maybe it's you know, it's, you know, really creating a time when they can really drop in and converse about it. And we want them to understand which of our needs are being met. I'll try not to go too long on this. Um, is this question relevant for people? Raise your hand just so I know how much time I can give to it. Okay, most people are raising their hand. It breaks my heart to see there's a, a couple I'm working with right now who have an 18 year old son who is completely entitled, has no sense of responsibility at all. And his, his mother's a doctor, his father's a pilot, 
They've done everything for this kid. And he's just, it's just terrible the way he treats them because they didn't establish that we're all family and we all take care of each other. Conversely, the most beautiful family in a way that I know is a single mom who has four sons. And from right away, it was like, your dad is gone. It's just us. And we all have to take care of each other. And I've had dinner there several times and I've watched those boys. They automatically do the dishes. They automatically clean the kitchen. The older boys take care of the younger boy. And there's no complaining. There's no eye rolling. There's no, because they've been trained. That's our family culture. So ideally, we establish in any new friendship, in any new love relationship, and in our family culture, we all take care of each other. There's mutuality. We have to establish that ideally along the way. So that's ideal. If we aren't there, if we haven't really established that, then we have to establish that. We have to really help the teenagers understand that your needs are just as important than theirs. Now, I would probably diplomatically start by acknowledging their needs, their need to not clean the kitchen because they want freedom, independence, they don't want to deal with it, they want ease, they want harmony, they want to go play with the Xbox. You know, acknowledge what's important to them so that I'm dropping into their world. And then I would go into a connection request of inviting them to drop into my world. Right? Drop into my world. This is my day. This is what I did today. This is why I'm exhausted. This is why I don't really have a desire to clean up your mess. And this is why it would mean so much to me if you showed love for me, care for me. It would really mean a lot to me. Now, of course, we're right on the edge of a guilt trip, right? So I want to acknowledge that. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a balance. So you got to keep going back and forth and maybe even say, I'm not trying to guilt you into it. I'm longing for you to care about my needs. I care about your needs and I'm longing for you to care about mine. And it's a retraining, you know. Um, is that helpful? Yeah. Um, and I guess just to apply it to anybody, not just children or teenagers, we want to weave our genuine care for their needs with asking, requesting their genuine care for our needs. So we weave back and forth. That's where we usually blow it. We usually blow it by either just focusing on their needs or just focusing on our needs as opposed to weaving back and forth. Yes, Laura. I just, I wanted to say that I noticed like uh, with kids or beloveds um, that sometimes it's once you get to that space where you just talked about where you're like, you know, my longings and, and uh, I think it's really helpful to add that, you know, things don't always have to be done in a certain amount of time. If we can negotiate a time period, you know, like within three or four hours or whatever. And I think that's really helpful so that people don't feel like, oh, you're guilting me or making me or. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, I mean, I think the key word she's saying is giving a range of time. And that way it's less demanding and there's more spaciousness, right? And you're absolutely right. We want to always give, always give a person a choice. So thank you so much, Laura, for saying that because it, it triggers. Ideally, we want to give people a choice. You know, would you be willing to just clean the dishes before you go to bed tonight? You can do it now. You can do it in two hours, but before you go to bed tonight. So there's a range of time. So thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, reflections? Hannah. Yes. Okay, I won. Hi. Yes. Um, hey. So I was, I was having fun. I have a, a son for, well, you guys probably, most of you know that, but um, I have a teenager. And I've noticed what I'm about to say, I think applies not just to kids. I think kids tend to reflect um, more clearly what also goes on with adults sometimes. But what I've noticed with him is when 
if there's ever a situation where he's acting like he doesn't care about contributing or care about my needs or my requests, it's because he's either not caring for himself, um, he's out of the, the habit of caring for himself, or he doesn't feel like I care about him in some way. And I think that applies to adults too and adult interactions. And so there can be some ways to kind of intuit and converse around filling in those gaps and making those connections mm. um, with the kids so that it kind of addresses a more core, um, a more core issue. So that's a, my thought. That's beautiful. You know, thank you. Um, care. You know, we all want to be cared for. When we feel cared for, our heart opens and we're more likely to want to meet each other's requests. So thank you for that. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions, reflections? Okay, we'll go back. All right. Um, the last kind of request that we talk about here is a guessing request. Um, and that's often what's necessary when we're with somebody who's feeling shut down, contracted, or they just have trouble expressing themselves. Uh, it might be somebody who's shy or introverted. So that's where we want to um, ask a guess, but please remember the difference between childlike curiosity and prosecutorial tone. The difference between, wow, would, would you like to hear me share more about why I'd like this? Versus, would you like to hear me? Do you want to understand me? Right? It's like our tone of voice is everything. So really watch your tone of voice and make sure your intention is genuinely, you are guessing. You are curious, you aren't demanding, you're not um, being rhetorical, you're genuinely guessing. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, now these next ones are awesome. Um, please, and, and learning to say this is, a, is really different. I mean, this goes way against how most of us were raised. I doubt your parents ever said to you, please, honey, do not fulfill my request if you're doing it out of guilt, shame, fear, duty, or obligation. Whose parents said that to them? <laughs> I don't see many hands going up. Please don't fulfill my request if you're doing it because you think you should, or to gain my affection or acceptance, or because you are afraid of how I'll react if you don't. Isn't that powerful? So different from the way we've been raised and the way most of us talk or think. Please fulfill my request only if you're giving from the heart joyfully. Only if you're doing it from your own desire or need to contribute. Please fulfill my request if it meets one of your needs, one of your values. Does it meet your value to have a clean kitchen? Would you be willing to fulfill my request for that reason? Right. It's really, really powerful to start thinking this way. And honestly, as I'm reading, <laughs> I'm recognizing I've, I've taught this many times and I still don't do this too much. Um, and it's, it's such a different mindset, isn't it? So I'll come back and I mean, you could just see what people's responses are to that. What, what comes up for people as you saw that? Who experienced it as science fiction? <laughs> Daniel, on a problem. Yes, Mimi. Oh, I thought you were asking, like, I was raising my hand, I guess. Well, I saw you, I saw you raise your hand at the beginning before I asked the question, so. Um, I, I love it, and it's part of what I believe um, in working with young people, part of what I believe is. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that was your comment. Cool. Um, thank you. Anybody have thoughts, comments that came up for you? 
Any questions? Laura. Well, I just, you know, it, I mean, it was a great thing to look at and I've been very um, aware of Rosenberg's, you know, I just think it's such a beautiful concept, but I also felt a sad because it's not, how any of us are really trained deeply, you know? I mean, I think we're all that way when we first meet somebody and mm. we want to, you know, we want them to like us and to attach to us and all that. And we want to attach to them, but you know, then this other training, right. Of you should, and it should, and you know, and so it just, I don't know. I feel a little sadness. That's all. Wait, are you yeah. saying? <laughs> 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 well, you know, and it certainly is true is the more, comfortable and familiar we get with somebody we tend to get sloppier and sloppier and less and less conscious and in a sacred relationship in a divine partnership we use the divine partnership to become more conscious not less and you know that really is that's a true healthy soul partnership but again that's it's different from what we see in the movies, because in the movies, what we see is boy meets girl, mm -hmm. boy and girl don't get along, boy wins girl over, movie ends, you know. Um, we don't see them 10 years later when their yeah. communication has gotten sloppy, right? Yeah. yeah. So, that, and that's why our, what we're doing, because almost all of you are relationship coaches or on that track. That's why this work is so important, is to really help people use our relationships, especially when they're getting hard, after the honeymoon phase is over, you know, we can actually maintain a honeymoon phase forever if we stay curious and we stay conscious because there's always more to learn. There's always more ways that we can improve our consciousness, our awareness, through the dynamic of our relationships and not just romantic relationship but all of our relationships family friends people we work with yeah any other thoughts or reflections yes jeff and it's nice to have you with us today jeff i imagine you're trying to uh, um yeah it's go. great to be here as i just got back from southern california in a lovely christmas and uh Woke up and Anaprabha said, hey, you could be, you know, you could probably guest in today if you're into it. And I was like, yeah. So I miss this, uh, this family, this environment, this, this, uh, you know, this beautiful laboratory of soul that you got going here. Um, so, yeah, one thing that comes up for me here and, and, you know, I've been practicing and working with relationship essentials tools since the class and it's been incredibly fruitful. But this is a really important point here because if we get into this relationship and we get to a place that's in the beginning and we have this express agreement about something, right? Mm -hmm. and, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to meet each other here. And then we see it's not being fulfilled. So then how do we go back and say, oh, well, I only want you to fill it, if, you know, fulfill this if, if it feels right or, you know, if it's coming from this place. When in fact, I'm, what I want to say is, hey, I, I kind of need you to honor our agreement. You know, this is, this is something that we, it was a free will agreement. So how do we do that without it being demanding uh, and yet still appealing to that good nature to, to, to want to do it? Yeah, great question. Um, well, I think a few things come to mind. Um, first of all, whenever we're talking with somebody about something challenging, it's important for us to be well-resourced and ideally for the other person to be well-resourced. Um, have I talked about that yet in this class? No, I know not today, but have I talked about the whole well-resourced thing? Well, if you, if you have, could you review it? Yeah. So isn't it amazing how none of us would imagine getting in the car and driving a long distance on an empty gas tank? Like we've all learned, oh, I've got, I'm driving for 30, you know, 300 miles, I got to fill up my ta gas tank. But almost all of us, still engage in difficult conversations when we're exhausted or we're hungry or we're tired or we're stressed or conversely, we engage somebody else in a difficult conversation when they're exhausted or they're stressed or they're tired or they're hungry, right? Or they're distracted. And then we wonder, 
why it, it becomes a shit show, right? Well, that's like wondering why, you know, the car's not running, well, I didn't put gas in the tank. It's exactly that. So learning to be well resourced is a really, really, really important part of life that most people don't think about in our culture. Um, and I actually now start every session that I do, whether it's with a couple or an individual, I always start by asking two questions. Would you like me to record today's session? And how well resourced are you? And asking how well resourced are you is a nice alternative to how are you. How many times has somebody asked you, hey, how are you? And you just say fine, even though you're not fine. You're pissed off, you're elated, you're exhausted, you're exuberant, you're sad, but no, instead of really going into any of that, we say, oh, fine, right? So it, it's not real often. If you ask somebody, how well resourced are you? Most of the time you're gonna get kind of a quizzical look because most people aren't used to that question. And then they say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, I'd really love to know, are you stressed? Did you get a good night's rest? Have you had a good breakfast? You know, it's like you start asking questions that really point more fully to our true condition. Does this make sense so far? And it's a really wonderful shift that I've kind of cultivated in, in my relationships. An interesting thing, I gave a keynote speech to over 300 doctors about a year ago. And I, I'm up on the stage, I said, so let me ask all of you, how well resourced are you? And there's just like this kind of energetic of confusion. And I said, how many of you have heard the term well-resourced. These are doctors, mind you, doctors, the people that are responsible for our health. How many of you have heard the term well-resourced? About 20% of the people raise their hands. How many of you have never heard the term well-resourced? The majority of people raise their hands, right? So our doctors don't even think this way. So it's a, I know I'm kind of going off on of the question with Jeff, but it's really important. We start by making sure we're all well resourced. Let's have that family conversation about the dishes and about chores when we're all focused, we've had a good meal, we're present with each other, and we can really talk and really listen and hear each other. So that's the first thing. Do it when both parties are well resourced. The second thing is what I said before, weave back and forth. So that, like Laura said, they're feeling cared for, right? So using, I think what I heard from Jeff, even if we've made an agreement, how do we ask them to keep that agreement without sounding like we're demanding? Well, we kind of check in, we create connection. How well resourced are you? How are you doing today? Really want to talk to you about something important. And that's also an important thing, is creating a container for the conversation. So making sure that when we're requesting the conversation, the other person is really agreeing to it. They're not just doing it because, oh God, what's Jeff gonna say to me now? Oh shit, what did I do wrong? You know, Because right? that's usually what can happen when we request a conversation, is the person's afraid we're gonna make them wrong or tell them what they did wrong or whatever. So a way to bypass that, and this is, these are good words that what I'm about to share with you to memorize or to write down. Maybe somebody can put this in the chat box. I wanna talk with you about something important because I wanna have a great relationship with you. Or I wanna have this conversation because I want for us to have the best relationship possible. And that has to be your intention, by the way. Not just words, the intention even if you know, the roommate has made a mess after agreeing to clean the kitchen and they didn't, if your intention is to make them wrong or criticize them, don't have the conversation until you've changed your intention. The intention is always to be understood and equally to understand that. So can you get into the headspace of wanting to understand 
why they didn't clean the kitchen and being just as interested in why they didn't clean the kitchen as you want them to be in, interested in your reaction to that, your, the impact. So we always have to have the intention of seeking to understand each other. If we don't have that intention, and we all fall into what I'm about to say, if we have the intention of making them wrong or attacking them or criticizing them, no, it's not gonna go well. Especially with kids, because kids can feel it. Kids like, you know, they're like, you know, they feel it in their body. Or most of you, because you're all empathic, you know, so you all feel it. So I've said a lot, and I'd love to open it up to what stands out for people or any thoughts, questions, reflections about all of that. Hannah, and then Deborah. One thought that I have to offer to your question. Jeff, which is a great question, by the way, is um, when I am in relationship to make agreements with people, I have a value for the human element of change to be considered as in agreements. If to me, if agreements are not plastic, malleable, able to be changed, when we change as people, when our values change as people, then they can be binding in ways that are not healthy to the relationship. So possibly a way to go about if you're finding that a great, an agreement is not being met is to actually engage them in asking if they're, if they're desiring to renegotiate that agreement, if, mm -hmm. if there's maybe grounds for renegotiation. Because I'm imagining you would want any agreement that someone's meeting with you to be authentic and for, for them to be fully on board. And so sometimes that's the only way to do it. Renegotiate. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's really, let's twinkle on those. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely establish. Of course, what we want to do is say, look, any agreement can be renegotiated. But once we've agreed to it, that is the agreement until we've had a quality conversation and we've made a new agreement. So I would just add that little piece in there. Um, I think it's Deborah and then Deborah and then Mandy. I really appreciate this uh, so much that I realize this is so crucial, like you said, and I, I reflect on a, a, a situation I had the other day when um, I realized I was entering a conversation with somebody on the phone for one thing where you can't see each other's, you know, smile or sensitivity of the eyes. And so um, she was wanting to give me some feedback and I was, didn't register that I was already grieving and missing my parents who are now dead. It was, I think, yeah, the day before Christmas. And I was, um, so I was feeling sensitive, raw, tired and hungry. And I entered this conversation. And so I, I realized when we're resourced, we can um, listen more deeply, receive challenging situation with a little more buffer and cushion. And um, so I'm just realizing how important this is. And I can sure. share, share it with my friends so we can, uh, we've already done a do-over. We've already had a wonderful breakthrough, but I'm going to now share that because I know she'll love it. She's a therapist. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Yeah, I really want to encourage all of you. Try, try that instead of, hi, how are you? Hi, how well resourced are you? You know, and keep asking yourselves, and certainly for couples like Mandy and Israel, Anna and Jason, Rob and Laura, you know, it's wonderful for couples to support each other by, hey baby, how well resourced are you? You need some food? You need rest? Can I give you a head rub? And you know, whatever it is. Um, Mandy, I saw that you had your hand up. So from everything that you've been talking about, and I mean, the seems like the key hugest thing is it's all about like the energy of your approach. You know, like when you, uh, well, and it depends on, you know, how you're approaching, like if you're going to ask somebody something or if you want to like address an issue in the relationship, it seriously has to do with like your energy and your, your vibe. Because like if you, mm -hmm. if somebody's coming at you with an aggressive kind of energy, our reaction is to, to match that, which is usually going to be fight, flight, defense, whatever. Um, 
Exactly. And because I mean, that's definitely something I, I've been learning about um, with, with the romantic partnership is like, like, how is the approach? And it's also about how you word, how you word it, like being careful with how you word things. Like um, in that book, The Four Agreements, one of the first things they say is be impeccable with your word. So it's yeah. like, be careful the way you word things. And the more gentle, the better, because you don't know what could be triggering to the other person. And that goes with any relationship, you know, whether it's a coworker or a family member, it's like, you have to be kind of gentle with your energy and gentle with your words if you want to get anywhere. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, if you're the recipient of somebody who's coming at you with an aggressive kind of energy or tone or words, the best thing is to kind of be in a neutral energy and, and to just kind of process what they're doing because you have, ultimately it's, you have the control over how you react. Mm -hmm. You don't have control over what the heck they're saying to you or asking you or their, you know, vibe. You can ask them, Hey, can you please tone it down or can mm -hmm. you lower your voice or can you not be so aggressive? Like point it out to them, you know, but like it, 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 at the end of the day, you have the control over your reaction and, and how you respond to that energy. Absolutely. Um, so two things I just want to riff on. Yes, getting our inner, you next, Debbie Garcia, um, getting our inner world together so that we're approaching that person from a loving place and a curious place and a, a genuine mutual desire for understanding. And if they're coming at us, um, just a slight adjustment to what Mandy suggested. If somebody's coming at us and they're being loud or aggressive, remember, we always want to weave our needs with theirs. So rather than just saying, will you please lower your the tone of your voice? What I'd recommend is, I really want to hear what you have to say, and I can hear you even better if you please lower the tone of your voice. People are loud because they want to be heard. People are aggressive because they want to be seen or to get their way. So if we acknowledge we can connect more easily by doing this and that we can meet their need to be heard by requesting them to actually lower the tone of the voice, you know, I can hear you much better if you stop hitting me in the face. It's really hard to concentrate on your words when you're punching me right now, you know, being facetious. But again, weaving are imagining or understanding of what they want with what we need. Right? We're always wanting to weave the needs together. And someone who weaves needs beautifully, Debbie Garcia, you're up. Hello, everybody. Um, I, two things. One is I wanna just say that I just actually experienced some of this and the I'd love to be able to hear you didn't didn't fly and then I so I just kept allowing and I kept I love Mandy we, we stay center you stay calm in the center of the storm and I didn't have any need to be right or validate or anything just allowing it to go but what I did do is I said I'm going to need okay let them just spew and then I said, now, can you give me a few minutes to, pro can you give me a few minutes here to process everything that you just said so that I can make sure that I've heard you, so that I could at least get a break in that energy of the friction, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't part of the friction, so I wasn't pushing it along, if that makes sense. I wasn't helping that along. Instead, what came to me was to do that and to ask for a moment to just because I really because what they're saying is important. So I am acknowledging they're important and they I want to hear them. But I had to do it in a little bit different way because I wasn't being heard uh, when I requested uh, the change of the, the change of tonality. And I love that you brought up the four agreements because that was a lifesaver for me a few years ago. I want to jump over to agreements really quick. So I want to talk about this from a different perspective just for a second. I have my own life in my old codependent um, nature. I would make agreements and bite off more than I could chew. And then I would go into shaming because I couldn't meet the agreements. And what I finally, what I finally learned was to say I need to, and this was after working with Scott, 
I started realizing that if I was going into agreements that were not, and let's say they were great when we made them, but something's shifted, happened, whatever, life changes. And I loved how you said this, Hannah, to be malleable and to be ever flowing and changing because those agreements do have to get changed. But I've noticed it from myself. It started with me observing that I was making agreements I couldn't uh, uphold. And then if I didn't say anything or if I didn't talk about that and, and reapproach the agreement, then I went into shaming myself. So um, I just thought that I wanted to share from, from my own space, like how that I've had to look at that. And it allowed me to really see what's real for the other to step into uh, creating that safe container and saying, can we, we, can we talk about that agreement? And I want to share some things that came up that are going on for me right now. And I still want to meet needs with you. And I still want to be in some sort of agreement with you, but let's look at how that that could be possibly changed that I can actually meet it because I don't feel like I can. So, and I don't want to create disappointment and, and um, broken expectation and hurt. So that's all. Thank you, Debbie. It's Twinkle Debbie and Twinklings for everybody who's shared. Um, I think what I want us to do is just take a short break. Let's take a, our little four minute break, just brief for bathroom or tea. And then we're going to come back to the second half of today's class, which is how to say no, how to hear no, how to deal with no. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. Um, and let's all be back in four minutes. That would be at 11 o'clock California time. Thank you for coming back. Anybody else? Love for you to turn your cameras on. It's always nice to see everyone. And we are now going to talk about one of the most difficult parts of relationship, how to say no and how to hear no. And this <clears throat> first piece is like the key to it all. We're going to talk about how to say no first. Whenever you're saying no, or you're setting a boundary, lead with authentic reassurance that you care. If somebody can write that into the chat box, that'd be great. I'll say it again. Whenever setting a boundary or saying no, lead with authentic reassurance that you care. And those words are very deliberate. I've been using that little expression for many, many years. Thank you, Daniel, for putting it into the chat box. I really appreciate that. Um, because what stops it from going well is either our fear that the other person is going to think we don't care about them, so then we really don't set the boundary or we don't say no or we let that person cross the boundary because we want to be a nice guy or a nice gal right because almost all of us are caring people and we want people to know that we're caring and so we're not clear with our no or we're not clear with our boundaries so that's one side of it and then the other side of it is often when we hear no we interpret it as you don't care about me we often interpret no as a personal offense so that's why we want to just right off the bat deal with that. So you have to choose what is an example of authentic reassurance that you care for that person. So I'll do a few examples and then guess what? You're all going to do examples in your lives. So um, let's say, you know, somebody uh, you know, we're teaching class and somebody really wants to share something and I feel like we need to move on, right? So ideally, if they're saying, I really have something else I want to share and I feel like we're running out of time, we need to move on. Ideally, I'm going to say something along the lines of, um, I'll make up a name, John. Uh, I really appreciate your enthusiasm and, and your offerings, but I do need us to move on. So. Um, I'm sorry, but perhaps you can put into the chat box what you wanted to say, right? I let John know that I care, I appreciate him, I'm giving him an alternative, but I'm not changing my boundary, I'm not changing my no. Now let's talk about a more difficult one. When somebody 
wants to ask you out on a date or somebody wants to explore a deeper level of intimacy. Okay. We've probably all been on both sides of that one. Nothing more painful than the just let, let's just be friends speech, right? Um, so one way to do that would be to say, thank you. I really appreciate maybe the courage it took to ask and the beauty of your request. And thank you. It's a really beautiful, beautiful request. And I want you to know that I care about you. I care about our friendship. And at this time, I really want to stay uh, as platonic friends. And I'm really hoping that we can grow our platonic friendship in a platonic way that's mutually rewarding. So notice how I'm setting the boundary, but I'm really giving a lot of appreciation, a lot of care. Does that make sense? I'm going to give one more example. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but I love you guys. So this is really personal. Um, when my wife was still alive, she made her living as a tour guide. Um, and her work was seasonal. She had she worked for a company that provided her with a luxury bus and a bus driver. And uh, on a Monday morning, she would pick up, or actually it would be usually Monday noonish. She would pick up 40 to 45 Germans at the airport in San Francisco, and they would then start their tour of the southwestern United States. And the tour would last for 13 days. Uh, she would come back in on a late Saturday night. On Sunday or Tuesday, she would um, take them on a final tour. So, and when she would get her schedule, I would mark the dates. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay. Um, I would mark the dates so that on that Saturday night and Sunday, I would meet her at the hotel. And that would be our like little brief time to be together because then she's starting another tour the next Monday morning. And she'd come in late Saturday night. I'd be there waiting for her. Sunday morning, boom, early, she's taking them off on tour again, taking them to the airport. Then I would usually meet her at the airport. Um, and we would have like from two or three o'clock in the afternoon until the evening to be together before she started her next tour. But during that afternoon, she would have to do laundry or maybe do some shopping or new, do some preparation for the next tour. So by the time we got back to San Francisco, had a nice dinner, had a bottle of wine, it's usually nine or 10 o'clock at night. And of course, I'm hoping we're gonna make love because it's been two weeks or more. And she would, you know, want to, but she was exhausted. And she knew she was gonna to have to get up at six o'clock in the morning. She was not well resourced. And on, this happened over and over and over again. But she did something really wonderful. And she's who taught me offering authentic reassurance that you care. She would take a few minutes to really reassure me that she was still sexually attracted to me. She wanted to make love. She was just too exhausted. And she would acknowledge my disappointment, maybe my frustration. She would acknowledge that she was also feeling kind of sad and disappointed and frustrated. And she'd give me a lot of reassurance that, honey, as soon as this season is over, please, let's, you know, you know, we're going to go on a nice vacation. We're going to spend a lot of time. We'll make up for it. And, and she was beautiful about it. You know, she would make sure that I felt her love, her care, and, and she would hold the space for my disappointment. And then I'd give her a kiss and she'd go to sleep and I'd take a cold shower. Point being, offering authentic reassurance that we care is so, so, so important when we're saying no or we're setting a boundary. So any thoughts, questions, or reflections on that? Deborah. I will Thank you. First of all, thank you for sharing such a sweet, wonderful story, you know, that's so, that's, um, has a certain tenderness, especially since she's in heaven. So I know that's a really tender story for you. So I just want to empathize. Thank you, Deborah. 
Thank yeah, you. deeply with that. Yeah. And, and, you know, it bring it reminds me of another um, kind of reassurance skill that I just want to share with our family here that I learned from Charles and Carolyn Muir when I was studying Tantra with my husband in Maui. And that was um, the, uh, they call it the nurturing meditation. And in a situation like that, when you might have not have time to make love or, or you've had some kind of a challenge or upset and you want to reconnect, but you're not ready to make love or something, um, to spoon each other and yes. then breathe, breathe through the chakras and to start with the heart and come back to the heart last and then go down to the root and come up the chakras and you're breathing together. And it's just a reassurance, like we, can, we care, we're connecting, this is transcends all words and um, we love each other. So I just wanted to share that. It just came up um, to add on as a whole set. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Deborah. Uh, Debbie. From Deborah to Debbie. Okay. So I'm going to share uh, actually a recent, some recent experiences. I'm single. And when it comes to intimate connection, I'm not I have very, very strong, strong, strong boundaries about this for my own purpose, for my own well-being. And I have had to have these conversations and it is super important to reassure uh, the person that it's not that I'm not attracted to you and I need, but actually approaching the agreement from the very beginning and never stepping outside of my own integrity, which is something Scott works with me on because even a couple years ago, I was going to go on a date. I'm like, Scott, you know, just so that I could really learn how to do this and putting these tools in place and making an agreement with somebody, what that looks like in my life, because I have a lot of male friends that are platonic is that we can hang out. We can cuddle. It's completely platonic. They know their boundaries. They know it's not, it's not up for just, dis- I won't have the discussion. This is how it is in my life. If you want to like hang out, we'll watch a movie or whatever. That's cool. But the discussion there's not an elephant in the room of somebody who has got an attraction that another person's not addressing there's not an elephant in the room with uncomfortable uh boundaries being crossed if we are absolutely 100 percent honest from the very beginning about what works for us and what doesn't and what feels good and what doesn't and i haven't gotten past that yet i'm still there so I can't tell you what it's going to look like when, it's, it, when it actually progresses. When, when I, I don't have a relationship that's going to progress at that point to, their, to anything more right now. Right now, I'm in friend zone with everybody. So, uh, but it's super important with my guy friends because I'm like, I have a lot of wonderful male friends that I love them, but we make sure, God, man, making sure that everybody's on the same page is just vital. I don't care what relationship it is it's my son if it's my girlfriends guy friends whatever it's just it's this is probably the most important thing i think scott one of the most important things he's teaching about the the sacred no we all know about sacred yes that's right thank you mimi yes and i just wanted to know can you uh, say this one more time about only do this from a place of because I think that that's a key piece that I wanted to understand I'm only do this not because I'm not going to love you but only do this from a place of if you say no I can you repeat that one piece for me please it's on your document that you were showing or oh, um from before before the break it's yeah. the document before the break Yes, before the break, it was the, this key piece of when somebody is saying a no to you, that um, only give your full yes if you're able to show up here. Right, right. So let me give a, a brief backstory. The, one of the ones is um, only say yes if this is contributing to your needs or your values or your need to contribute to me. Um, one of the great Marshall Rosenberg quotes is the greatest joy in life is to contribute to the well-being of others. So the idea is to say yes, 
because you want to contribute to me or you want to support my needs to be met or because this somehow is also supporting your needs or your values. And just a reminder that depending on who you're talking to, you know, you could use the word needs or values or desires or longings of the heart. And it really depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to a man, use values, you know. Um, most men don't want to be seen as needy, right? So most men, generally speaking, have trouble with the word needs, um, but they don't have trouble with the word values. Um, I use the word values more most of the time now. Um, I've just found it's more palpable. Um, of course, we, from the NVC point of view, we were taught universal human needs, but it's really universal human needs, values, longings, desires. Okay. Now here's what I'd like, oh, Mark, yes. Yeah, I, I recently had a, a really hard no um, because my son and I had a misunderstanding and he thought that I was going to pay for something that I didn't want to. And I rarely in his lifetime probably said no to him very often, but it wasn't even about the money. It really wasn't at all about the money. It was really about the appropriateness of it. And it just, I couldn't do it and feel good about it or feel that it was appropriate. And the only reason I would have done it is just because it was too hard to say no to him. Um, and it was really good though that we both, uh, he's, he's, he's 30 and, so he, he's, some, he's mature and we both were able to assure each other during the almost you know, rough discussion that we both loved each other. And that mm. was re really good. I think the hard part in, in the aftermath of it all though, which, I, which I'm realizing as, as we, you were talking about the no's, is that a lot of times when you have these no's, it's, it requires an expl explanation. It's like mm -hmm. the other person wants to know why no, and your explanation might not meet their um, uh, idea of the world or, or, or what reasons they think. So it's when you can't come to um, an acceptable place where you both think that it's it was a fair no, um, it's like, how do you leave it? And it was, you know, we both left it because we both, I, I stopped it because I realized we had gone as far as we could. And that if we continued going, we were kind of in a good place. And I felt that if we continued going, it would have gone downward. And mm -hmm. so I left it. But in, in retrospect, I think it would have been valuable if I had said, listen, I know we both haven't achieved our complete understanding with each other. And you know, I, I welcome you to come back and hopefully you welcome me to come back in the future to continue it from a different place after the wound is healed a little bit. Yeah, thank you, first of all, Mark, for being here. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and it's a great example for us to work with for a minute. So again, I'm gonna repeat myself about something, but it's really, this is just like so critical and comes up again in Mark's example. Our intention must always be mutual understanding. And remember, you can understand another person without agreeing. You don't have to agree in order to understand. You can understand why somebody thinks Donald Trump is great without agreeing, okay? But what gets in the way is we don't agree, so we struggle with either seeking to understand or acknowledging their reality, right? Again, just acknowledge the reality, right? Acknowledge the reality. Now, there are three pits that I've discovered, that I've learned over the years, that we can fall into as human beings that get in the way of understanding each other. And I think, I'm guessing that Mark and his son fell into one or two of these pits. There are three pits that I've identified. The first pit is right, wrong. The moment we're in a right, wrong dynamic, we're no longer seeking to understand each other. We're trying to prove I'm right and you're wrong. Yes, this is something 
that is worth being paid for. No, it's not something that I want to pay for. Um, the second pit we can fall into is a power struggle. And there may have also been a, the dynamic between Mark and his son. The son wants the money and the dad doesn't want to give it. And it's not even about the money. It's about, you know, what the money was going to go for. But there's a power struggle. And at the moment we're in power struggle, we're not seeking to understand each other. We're, we're you know, it's like tug of war, right? I'm going to get this. No, you're not. I'm going to get this. No, you're not. So when do we fall into power struggle? And the third one is uh, the one that I think way back, you know, Mandy talked a little bit about, attack and defend. The moment we think we're being attacked, judged, blamed, shamed, criticized, reptile brain takes over. And the moment our reptile brain takes over, we defend ourselves. Guess what? Every time we're defending ourselves. we create disconnection, the other person feels attacked, and now they're in <laughs> reptile brain. My dog just jumped down to see, every time I do that, the dog jumps to see what's going on. It's pretty cute. Um, so attack and defend, power struggle, right, wrong, are the pits that we fall into. And please memorize those, be aware of them. And so couples like Mandy and Israel and Jason and Hannah and Rob and Laura, big brownie points. Anytime you go, oh, honey, I think we're in a power struggle right now. Hey, baby, are we in attack and defend right now? Right? And just noticing when you've fallen into the pit. And then, you know, take each other's hands or hold each other or like Deborah said, spoon each other, you know, connect and get out of the pit together. Because you, we all will fall into those pits, especially when we're living with somebody or we're in, in a deep romantic relationship with somebody. We will fall into those pits, and not just romantic relationship. Mandy and her kids, um, you know. Uh, so, Rob and Laura, I saw Ra, uh, Laura raise her hand. Oh, Rob just wants to know where we can get that thing. Because when I, you know, I always want to have this conversation, and then Rob, Rob immediately goes and. You know, I am um, uh, Amazon. Amazon. Oh, Amazon. Okay. Yeah. She, by the yeah. way, she wants to have that conversation about 10 o'clock at night <laughs> when I'm really tired. And, and then he yeah. could just go, and with I the thing. <laughs> yeah, well, and that one, make a sign that says, I am not well resourced, going to sleep now, right? Because yeah. that's what that's about. It's like, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a classic thing. You know, we're exhausted, we're tired, we just want to, and then, you know, you get the question. Do you think we'll be monogamous forever? Do you ever find other women attractive? <laughs> Do you think my girlfriend is sexy? No, honey, not at all. No, come on, be honest. No, I'm just gonna say, honey, be honest. Come on, it's okay, it's safe, it's safe. Well, yeah, she's kind of sexy. What do you mean she's sexy? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> We've all been there, I think. On both sides of that, by the way, on both sides. All right. Um, so. Now I want all of you to think of someone you've recently said no to, and it's been hard, or someone that you've set a boundary with that's been difficult. And I want for you to write into the chat box how you would offer authentic reassurance that you care while still setting the boundary or while still saying no. So we're gonna take a few minutes. Again, think of a real situation in your life where you had to say no or set a boundary. And how could you redo it? Or maybe you did it beautifully, but demonstrating by writing into the chat box, the authentic reassurance that you care while also putting into the chat box, saying no or setting the boundary. While I get my puppy who's tearing apart my birthday present. Hey, sweetie. No, that's not, you, that's not a toy. Not a toy. Not a toy. You.
get into these things. You get into these things. Thank you. All right. I think I can't step in the mouth. Really well done, uh, Mark. That was good. Right, Rob and Laura, good. Again, you are choosing a situation in your life where you had to say no or set a boundary with someone. I mean, going back to that situation and imagining either how you did or how you could offer reassurance that you care while still setting the boundary or while still saying no. I like Jason's example is a good example too. It's like finding, it's like he got in touch with what he was needing. She had a strategy for connection. He wanted connection and they came up with a different strategy to beat the mutual value for connection. Romandy, you definitely get the most dynamic example of a difficult no, <laughs> of, a, of a strong no. Not very pleasant having to tell people, that's how I got divorced. Mm. Yeah, that's a hard one, Mandy. <laughs> that's really, that's definitely Jerry Springer time. I laugh about it now, but it wasn't too funny back then, you know? No, of course not. But then again, even in that very difficult situation, where obviously it's a 100% no, no questions asked, how could you provide some care for your ex-husband? You know, just maybe pop that in the chat box. Like, how could you still show care while having a very clear, strong, solid no? Hmm. And again, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm appreciating what everybody's writing. So, you know, if I point somebody out, it's not to not appreciate what somebody else wrote. Um, Aaron's is a, is a really uh, interesting one because you can kind of, 
you know, if he's being accused of something, um, that's, we usually go into defensiveness and I'm appreciating how he stayed centered enough to express that, even though he was, you know, in accusation. <laughs> yeah, Mimi, I totally get that one. <laughs> It's great to have Mimi in the class with teenagers because teenagers always give us plenty of opportunities for challenging examples of how to do compassionate communication. Good example, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Just read Daniel's and Jason's. Hmm. So thank you, Anna. Prabh was talking about shame and guilt that comes up. And again, that's because we're afraid that the there's going to be the perception that we're not really caring and we so want to show care. And of course, there's no greater care than a mother, you know, for her child, even when the child is 45 years old. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's just, you know, but remember underneath all guilt is care. You know, you've heard me say that before underneath our guilt, you can always find care. Don't stay in the guilt. The guilt creates paralysis drop into the beauty of your care. I'm reading Jeff's. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, Mandy, well, that was, uh, that was an alternative. So something that came up in Jeff's example um, is quite often when there's a disagreement, um, and I covered this in my Connected Timeouts video, which hopefully all of you have watched, but um, there's a conflict between two people and one person wants to, you know, stay and work it out, even though it's three o'clock in the morning and we're both drunk. Um, and the other person wants to take space, right? Uh, and there's no right or wrong. What's interesting is the two different strategies to meet the same goal. The person wanting to take space and the one to talk it through until we work it out. Both people are actually wanting more harmony, more clarity. Sometimes we gain clarity or we and other people is like, no, I need to take space so I can get clear within myself. There's no right or wrong, but this is a great example of something that comes up all the time. Ideally, the person requesting space gets the space. But this is a perfect example of where they need to provide reassurance of, I'm gonna use this time to get centered. I'm gonna use this time that you're giving me space in order to get centered so I can come back to this conversation and we can really continue it. So that's a good example of where you need to give reassurance because the fear is you're just blowing off the conversation. You're blowing me off, you don't care. Right? That's usually the fear when somebody's wanting to take space. So again, a form of reassurance. 
I get it. This is really big. This is hard. We need to work this out. And I need to get clear. I need to get centered. I need to calm my nervous system down. So I, I'm going to calm my nervous system down. I'm going to get good night's rest. I need to be well resourced. If everybody is, if you've trained yourself and people around you, we only do this when we're well resourced. It's a lot easier to take space because we now have the agreement. Oh yeah, we're not well resourced right now. We're too stressed. We're too triggered. We're too angry. We're too hurt to really listen to each other. We need that space to get calmed down, to calm our nervous system, to be well resourced so we can, can come back. Now, if it's an appropriate in the relationship, you know, what Deborah Haviland brought up about you know, Charles and Caroline Muir and what I teach, I call it the holding exercise. Hold each other. If it's the kind of a relationship where you can hold each other, not for the purpose of having sex necessarily or at all, but just for the purpose of as mammals, we need homeostasis. And homeostasis calms our nervous system down. So if you can just relax and hold each other, even though the mind is still going, but you did this and you need to know, blah, 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 blah. The body's like, oh, shut up. This feels really good. Because right? our bodies remember love way faster than the mind and the ego. The mind and the ego still wants to be right or still wants to be heard. And the body just wants to relax and feel that goodness. Does that sound familiar to everybody? That makes sense? So thank you for you know, doing this practice. Any thoughts, questions, reflections before we move on? Yes, Deborah. I, I just want to say, and, and with what you're saying, the holding exercise, the deep breathing is really key. Mm -hmm. Because actually, scientifically, going into deep breathing, either alone or together, relaxes the parasympathetic nervous system so you can come back to the limbic. Right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. She's absolutely right. Thank you for adding that. Thank you. Okay, so we've talked about how to say no. Now we're going to do our last piece for today, which is how to hear no. And I have a little something I'm going to bring up here for us to look at. And this is going to be, if you want, a homework assignment. Um, but we'll kind of walk you through it right now. Um, so as I walk you through this, I want you to start by thinking of an example of someone or something that you have trouble hearing no to. Um, and again, the keys that are at the top, no is always an invitation to further dialogue. No doesn't have to be the end of the conversation, right? We don't have to get all pissy and, oh, well, you said no to me, fine. I don't love you either, right? We wanna to continue to dialogue by connecting with what needs are being met by the other person by saying no, you know? And you probably have always heard, you've probably heard the expression when you're saying no to one thing, you're saying yes to something else. What's that person saying yes to? So again, someone has said no to you, what are they saying yes to in their life? Which of their needs are being met by that no? And that's how you can stay connected, is by, instead of fighting the no, not going into power struggle, acknowledging. So, for example, if Mark's son had been able to go, oh, I get it, Dad. It's not that you don't want to give me money. It's that you don't feel comfortable. It doesn't meet your values to give me money for this thing, whatever it was. Um, I had that experience, by the way, last night. My friend Lori Grace took a a group of her friends to see this great show. It's a Donna Summer theatrical musical. And um, she took us all to the show and she took us all out to dinner. And she said, I'm paying for dinner except for alcohol because I don't drink alcohol, I don't promote alcohol, but you're all welcome to have drinks, but if you'd reimburse me for your drinks. That was really cool. I thought that was a really great example of her setting a boundary, not making anybody wrong. I actually had two glasses of wine because I had somebody else driving me to the show. Um, but she didn't want to, she wanted to pay for dinner, but not for the, for the wine or for the alcohol. So that was very cool. Okay, so let's do this practice. I want you to think of, and you don't have to put this into the chat box. Um, uh, you don't have to write down who the person is, 
but write down the situation. What's a situation where you're having a hard time hearing no? And what are your feelings and your unmet needs when you hear that no? What are your feelings and your unmet needs or your unmet values? Remember feelings, it's probably uncomfortable feelings, sad, disappointed, hurt, frustrated, angry, agitated, disappointed. These are likely possibilities for the feelings you might need, feel when you hear the no. And remember underneath all of those feelings are your unmet needs. I'm disappointed because I really wanted to connect. I'm sad because I'm missing you. I'm hurt because I'm afraid you don't love me, right? So we get in touch with our, our fears, our concerns of our unmet needs. Deborah, can you put it in the chat box maybe? Just do number one and number two so far. Just do number one and two. What's the no that you're hearing? What are your feelings and needs? Your unmet needs, your uncomfortable feelings. By the way, uh, since there's some really great stuff in the chat box, I'm going to save the chat box and I will post that so people can get access to the chat box if you want to read what other people wrote today, because there's some really great stuff in there. So again, what are your uncomfortable feelings? What was the no? What was the boundary? What were your uncomfortable feelings? Mm. Thank you, Anna. That's really, really, really powerful. Now, Mark, what's interesting is actually controlled and restricted are not feelings. They're what we call evaluations masquerading as feelings. If you feel, quote, controlled by somebody, that is a projection of the other person. Most of the ED words, um, manipulated, attacked, abused, not physical, just emotional. Um, obviously, if you're physically attacked, that's a whole other thing. But when we perceive we're being emotionally abused, emotionally attacked, uh, manipulated, um, rejected, um, all the ED words are what we call evaluations masquerading as feelings. And it's common that we say, I feel manipulated by you. But it's actually, what's more accurate is probably, I'm feeling scared, frustrated, angry, confused, um, because my need for mutuality or uh, my need for safety or my need for um, choice is not being met. My need for choice is not being met. I'm back now reading Deborah's and my propos. Hmm. 
going to close the chat box for a moment because I want to pull something else up. Just because, um, and I really appreciate that Mark actually put the ones up and we talked a little bit about the ED words. I did a class on this, which most of you were at before, but just to remember a reminder, if, if you look at this little list, this is the example, some of the examples of evaluations masquerading as feelings. And so you'll notice almost all these words end in ED but they all are actually projections of what someone else is doing. It's, it's an evaluation in our brain. You, you, know, you blamed me, you cheated on me, you criticized me. Those are all evaluations. What you're really feeling is in the next column over and what you might be needing is in the far right column. So this is a really great document and I'll, again, I'll repost it. I'm going to go back to you guys and go back to reading in the chat box. Mm. Thank you for sharing because you guys are sharing some really vulnerable and tender things. You know, it is hard when someone doesn't love us romantically the way we want to be loved. Well, Debbie and her mom about religious beliefs. So thank you, you know, thank you guys for these really beautiful, vulnerable shares. And so how do we hear that? Boy, I mean, like, okay, you guys have some really rich stuff here. Let's talk about rejected, because many of you talked about, you know, feeling hurt when you're not being met romantically the way that you'd like. And some of you may have heard my little spiel about rejected, but I'm going to repeat it for you to hear again or for some of you to hear for the first time. I feel rejected is probably something we've all said and felt. And it's the classic example of an evaluation masquerading as a feeling. Nobody can reject you. They're not choosing to love you the way you want to be loved or to care for you the way you want to be cared for. And just think about that. What's really true? Are you being rejected because there's something fundamentally wrong with you? You're a part on the assembly line that doesn't work? No. But what is true, and it's sad, is you wanted to be loved a certain way. You want to be cared for a certain way. You wanted to be kissed. Or you wanted to be held. Or you wanted to be a monogamous or whatever it was. And that person didn't choose to care for you or love you that way. And what's true is the way you wanted to be loved and cared for was probably beautiful. What you wanted was precious. What you wanted was sweet, loving. And they just weren't willing or capable of meeting you there. They weren't willing or even capable 
of providing you with that. But when we take that very sad disappointment and we add, and I'm going to use this word intentionally, the mind fuck of rejection, now we begin to create a lie. There's something wrong with me. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. And that's why they're not meeting my need. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with anybody. There's not. Again, in love coaching, we're not here to evaluate what's wrong with people. We're here to help remind people of how wonderful they are and how beautiful their longings of their heart are, even when the longings of the heart are not met. And there was nothing wrong with the person who couldn't meet your need, right? My dog is agreeing with that. We're leaving the world of right and wrong. We're leaving the world of good and bad. We're leaving that world. It hurts. It hurts that they couldn't love you the way you wanted. I will not deny that pain. Let's not deny the pain. Let's have empathy and compassion for the very real pain. But let's not add the story that you were rejected or abandoned because it's not true. What's true is they weren't capable or willing to care for you or love you the way you desired. Let's hold on to the beauty of the desire. Let's acknowledge the pain, the sadness, the disappointment of it not being met. And let's acknowledge this other person wasn't capable or willing. And that's okay. It's sad, but it's okay. And when we do it that way, we transcend out of right, wrong, good, bad. And we remain more available to get that precious need met. Because we're not now collecting evidence to prove that I'm rejectable. That's just what men do. They reject me. That's just the way parents are. They abandon their children. Or that's the way the world is. I get rejected. I get abandoned. Right? So do you, do you see how it's important to just like drop into the, the truth of our feelings and our unmet needs, but not to add the story, the evaluation, the judgment to the, to the scenario? I'll say one last thing about this and then I'll open it up and then we'll close. And Hannah, you'll be first. There was a woman I worked with many years ago and we were in a live workshop and she believed that her mother had abandoned and rejected her because her mother was a drug addict and couldn't take care of her. And so she was raised by her grandmother. And because she had grown up with the horrible story that her mother abandoned and rejected her, of course, she attracted relationship after relationship after relationship with men that would abandon or reject her. And by this point, she's a very attractive 40-year-old woman with a history of seven, eight heartbreaks, because this was happening over and over. And I gave the speech that I just gave, you know, a little bit, but just the short version. And she says, no, you don't understand. And she tells me the story about her mother, and she tells me the story about some of the men that have abandoned and rejected her. So I, I came in, I brought her into the center of the circle and I, and I said to her, what did she said to you guys? I said, what's really true? Did your mother abandon and reject you because of who you are? Or was she just not capable of taking care of you? And this woman had like a holy moment where she got it and realized the story she'd been carrying for 30 years was a story that wasn't true. And she started shaking, literally, her body started physically shaking. We had to come, we had to hold her because she had this holy moment realization. And eventually was able to see that her mother actually made the most loving choice she could, which is to put her with someone who could take care of her because the mother couldn't. The mother was a heroin addict. So we have to recognize that we often choose people that are not even capable of giving us what we need. Or life put us in a situation with somebody who wasn't capable, a father who wasn't capable of making it safe, a mother who wasn't capable of nurturing, right? Not everybody is Anapraba, right? Not all of us got an Anapraba for our mother, 
right? So, um, you know, it's really important to just recognize that it's oftentimes the needs are not because the person's not even capable. And then we're wanting them to be doing something they're not even capable of, okay? So I've gone on about this for a long time because it's so huge in recreating our story about ourselves, and then as coaches, helping people recreate their stories. And thank you, Mark, for actually sending me on that track by using those words. So I appreciate that. Okay, uh, Hannah, you're up. Hannah, you wanted to say something? Thank you. And actually, Jason wanted to share oh, it's something, Jason. so I'm going to let him go first. Cool. Well, actually, it's so both it, was, of us. it was actually me, and then he said, Oh, I actually want to say something too. And so I want to, I don't get to hear from him very often in this group. So. Yeah, we want to hear from Jason. Okay, well, yeah. The, so I just wanted to offer sort of a um, meta perspective on some of this, where for me, uh, all of these conversations, which are so rich, all of these principles that you're explaining are so deep and powerful. <clears throat> and every single one of them for me, as I translate them into personal experience, and then of course, in the context of client work as well, they all tend to boil down to opportunities for the inner work that we're all here to do. Um, you know, um, inner child work is probably the most concise way of capturing all of that. So whether we're talking about um, the challenge of making healthy, balanced, reasonable requests without going into vagueness or demand, um, for me often comes down to, you know, recognizing the strategies that I've formed um, around, you know, maintaining a feeling of connection by not asking for what I need. Um, things like that, or, you know, going into demand by virtue of the fact that I, at some point, adopted the strategy of becoming demanding because that was the only thing that seemed to get a need met at a certain mm -hmm. point. Um, and then on the other end of things, you know, hearing a person's no, or hearing another person's request um, can be really difficult uh, for the very same reasons, because there's a wounded part deep inside the inner child, perhaps we could say that uh, is attached to those stories, the story that I'm not worthy, that, that I'm the story that I'm being rejected, the story that I'm being controlled, or the story that I'm being deprived. And so all of these funnel into opportunities for, you know, self-love, and that's, I think that's what I see you teaching is this dropping into the healthier relationship with the self, regardless of what point, what side of the fence we happen to be on in these dynamics. And so um, this is mostly just for me to verbalize that that's what I see happening for myself, I guess. Yeah. That's part of why I value it so much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, that's a beautiful, yeah, that's all twinkle. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, either we are self-reflecting, again, that's emotional intelligence, we're either self-reflecting on all of this, oh God, I'm in my abandonment story, oh God, I'm in rejection story, or what happens is we go into blame, you know, it's like we go into, you know, making the other person wrong, making the world wrong, you know, and that's basically, this, it's either we're in victim, where we're reacting to the world, or we're in awareness, consciousness of, wow, why am I interpreting it this way? What is this reflecting to me? What is this teaching me about myself? And remember, when we get our biggest pains, we stimulate it. It's almost always God, life, nature's way of giving us another opportunity to revisit that wound, to revisit that story for the purpose of learning how to honor it, manage it, or transform it. And yes, I will post all the documents in the Facebook group. And if anybody needs it to be emailed to them, let, let me know and I'll email it to you. Um, we're almost at noon. Uh, Jason actually did a beautiful job of kind of bringing it to like what we want to do. Is there anybody that has a, a burning share or anything? Uh, if there's still 
Um, I realize that it's, it's noon and people are probably wanting to transition. And I was, I was realizing that there is a vulnerable um, question that's arising in me. And yeah. if there's space and time for that, I would love to be heard. I absolutely can stay. Does anybody need to leave right now or can everybody stay for a few more minutes? Great. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. And it piggybacks wonderfully off of what he was saying because it is, um, I'll just start with the statement that um, Take your time. Okay. Hey, Z, can you come back in a few minutes? Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, addressing the, that, where that, that fear or perception of being rejected or devalued comes from for me, and I think for a lot of people, but for me, it, it comes from that core childhood wounding space. And the experience specifically, I have to name it in order to ask the question so it makes sense, was that when I was 15, I found out that my father didn't believe I was his child and he was not willing to pay child support because of that. And I connected a bunch of dots about why it was that his family treated me certain ways that were different than the other grandkids and so forth. But to me, and I, I realize also I have a lot of empathy and understanding for him just based on his life and, and how he was treated. So, and I, I have, I realized that just because that was a reality that I do, even as an adult and even as a relatively healed, integrated person, I'm, I don't know any other words to describe that other than other than maybe not rejection, but denial of connection. I don't know. You're not. You're not my child, and I'm not going to provide for you. So, um, so I guess my my question is. I want to hold that in a light that is realistic and true, and not pretend that that isn't what it isn't. And I also want to hold that in a light that allows me to even more deeply fully move into healing those core wounds so that I don't have as much of an edge when I'm um, perceiving that someone's not valuing me. Mm -hmm. um, so your insight on, on that would be great. Uh, empathy first, second, and third. So let's all just drop in and acknowledge how painful her experience has been. The pain is absolutely real. Never deny the pain. Very sad, confusing when I think about part of the story, you know, why, why am I being treated differently than all the other grandkids? I'm imagining little Hana being confused, seeking to understand that and feeling really sad. Hmm. And scared maybe. Before I proceed with like kind of how to manage it and the question, I just want to stay in empathy. Would anybody else like to give some empathy to Hannah, please? Anybody else want to give some empathy to her? Daniel? Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for your vulnerability. Uh, such a tender tender heart subject 
Um, gosh, I can imagine just the shock and confusion that you must have felt when the person that you thought was your father suddenly didn't said that you weren't his child anymore. Oh my gosh. You can't imagine how how difficult that was. Hmm. You know, probably all of us might be like wanting to fix it and make it better. Like if you're noticing that going on for you, how perfectly human is we, you're just so open right now, Han, and we're feeling that such a, a shocking, shocking experience that you had, just so shocking to a child. So like, hurtful, shocking, scary, confusing. So we just feel that pain with you. We imagine it. And it's really, it's like imagining the unimaginable. It's like unimaginable for most of us, really. Like we could just glimpse, just glimpse it because it's so different from what most people experience. And so, Ideally, I would stay in empathy with you for like an hour, right? Because that's really what is like empathy, first, second, and third. Okay. In the interest of time, I'll get to your question, but I just want to say as a coach, I just want to stay in empathy with you for a long time first. So it's not trying to fix, you know, trying to fix something that's not, not easily fixed. Thank you. I received that. What's coming to my mind is that beautiful Rumi quote about the wound is where the light comes in. And so I'm just imagining, because I believe the meaning of life is we're here to learn to love ourselves despite our wounding, our disappointments. And because I, I have the blessing of knowing you, I just want to acknowledge what an amazing job you're doing of loving yourself in spite of that wound and loving the rest of the world, even with that wound. It's inspiring. And so uh, that's all I can say is it's like, yeah, there's this wound and it's probably always going to be there. But you're doing an amazing job of learning how to honor it, how to manage it, and to some degree heal it. And you heal it every time you acknowledge your son. You heal it every time you acknowledge who another person is because you know the horror of being denied, the horror of not being acknowledged for who you are. And so you're doing a beautiful job Anna, of using that wound, you know, Anna Prabha, the wound of not having a safe father. So she has always made sure her children are safe. Right? It's like we have these wounds and it's a good life when we go, wow, I know this pain. I'm not going to perpetuate it. I'm going to do my best to do things differently. Thank you. Does anybody else want to offer love, thought, an answer to her question? Oh, Mimi. Can you repeat the question for me one more time? 
sure the question is. I, I feel that it's important, uh, that an important part of accept the wound is to clearly name exactly what it means to me and exactly mm. how it affected me. And I do acknowledge that as something that is probably most clearly stated as something like rejection. I want to be clear about how I'm naming it and holding it. I also, and I also want to, I guess my question is, in light of the beauty and the truth of what Scott was sharing about how important it is to remind ourselves that even in that situation with my father, it was an example of him not being able or willing to love me and connect with me in the way that society would deem he, sh he is, has a responsibility to. Um, he wasn't able to, I know that. So there's, I don't know, I guess my question is, how do I stay in the place of compassionate understanding while naming the truth of of his actions, of his decisions, and in a way that's authentic. And how do I then move? I don't know. It's like this part of me just feels like it's just important to understand something about how to name it how to name it clearly and not bypass it by saying, well, it wasn't rejection, it was just this. Right. While holding on to the beauty, the beauty and the importance of realizing something isn't rejection, it really is about. It's like a paradox inside of me. It's like it's both and. Yeah. Okay. I think if I can just repeat that, but I think that I'm, that I'm certain that I'm here to say is that along with all of the justifiable rage, anger, sadness, that is this core kind of um, uh, inside, like the feeling, the, the emotions that are happening underneath it. There's also the challenge of wanting to provide some kind of faith or understanding where your dad is coming from with decisions. And one of the, is that accurate? Is that an accurate representation? Yeah. Uh, and one, Definitely an aspect. One more piece that that uh, I would that I, that I find balance in, in when I ask core questions is really embracing that discomfort of um, you know that was really messy. You came into a huge mess, and um, and that's unfortunate for a child because no child should, like, you should want to be wanting. So clearly there's that. And the, the, the deceitfulness, the um, unspoken rejection, and having to feel people's emotions without exactly knowing what's going on and having to decipher that, would, I would think would be really overwhelming. I would imagine that's very overwhelming. And then um, how I alert of other people's feelings and things that aren't being said, so secrecy. Um, so, uh, like the full embracing of the rage in there is is like there's there's a big mess there. <laughs> and so for me, like when I when I just felt all of that in my heart and in my throat, I'm like, oh, I'm so sad that you didn't know growing up that this had nothing to do with you, that this was before you, and this was in place before you, and that your core worth has nothing to do with that. That's just the messiness of some of us who didn't have to do that. So that's just what really came up for me, like, because I see how amazing and gorgeous you are and how beautiful you are and that reflection of you. I have a sadness that other people had messiness. Thank you, thank you, Mimi. Um, 
Uh, she said a lot of wonderful things. I'm just, I'm curious, Hannah, when did you feel most connected? Like of all that she shared, when did you feel the most connected? I connected the most with the recognition that there, there may be rage wanting to be felt and experienced inside of me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we always want to, it's all about connection, right? And feelings and needs. The answer to your question, it's not about the story. The story can be a few words. What's alive today are your feelings and the probability that there's unexpressed rage as well as other feelings and your unmet needs. And that's what Anuprabha understood too. Anuprabha wrote in the chat box, I can imagine your need for safety, love, connection, and inclusion wasn't met. It's a pretty good guess. And then she said, go into the feelings and body sensations. So what, what I'd encourage is I'm, I'm going to pull up briefly my friend the list of universal human needs and I, I want to invite you Hana if you'd be willing as you look at this list any word I mean it could be five words it could be 20 words which of these words were not met which of these values which of these beautiful universal human needs were not met by what happened and just say them out loud. Um, the physical sustenance, I would say provision. And in that security. Yeah. Ability, trust. Certainly connection. Uh, intimacy, nurturing. Court, warmth, to matter is huge. Acceptance, care, and compassion, and consideration of pretty much all of them. Yeah. <laughs> like everything on the list. Exactly. And if it's a self, if it's a self, because my identity got all sorts of scrambled from that. And understanding, I really don't feel like my family understands me at all and yeah understanding the meaning of my life my consciousness my efficacy and creativity in the world if i if my if it's not even worth it to my father to love me and provide me why is it worth it to me to provide for myself and to create gosh community belonging family support yeah inclusion yeah a lot honesty yeah a huge one like why yeah why it was just yeah yeah. Did you notice how as she was looking at the words, then the tears came? And that's when my tears came. Like when she was telling the story, it's a horrible story. But once we start feeling those so many unmet needs, and those are all needs that we know are precious because they're universal. They're all things we need. And so as she was sharing one after another, after another, after another, that got squashed, not met because of this experience. Oh my God, I feel that so much, right? That's how we work with it. And really, honestly, this is where like I'd, I'd like to, maybe one of you may wanna do two or three hours with her and hold space while she goes through every one of these needs that hasn't been met. Right? 
So if any of you feel inspired to do that, send her a private message. Okay, send her a private message. Um, because this is, this is where real love coaching comes in. We hold that space. You know, and, and as she mentioned some of the unmet needs, it was like, oh my God, I didn't even think of that one, of course, right? So, and for you, how to manage it, you recognize that you grew up with all these unmet needs and values and learning that there was never anything wrong with you. That was the lie. That was the story. There's nothing wrong with you. But because of choices, painful choices made by your father and your birth family, you've suffered a lot of consequences because of those unmet needs. And every one of those unmet needs will always be precious to you. And you'll probably always do your best to help other people get those needs met because you know how precious they are because they weren't met for so long in your childhood. Let's all twinkle, twinkle her. I'm gonna officially and speak to me. I'm, I'm feeling like I matter. It's wonderful. I'm gonna, I'm gonna officially end the class, but I'm gonna invite, if you want to, Hannah, for you to stay, and anybody else who wants to 